On behalf of the Australian Safe Communities Foundation and Safe Communities Foundation New Zealand, we're proud to present this webinar titled Child Safety Using Evidence-Based Strategies. In this webinar, you'll hear from four presenters who will provide different perspectives on how they use evidence-based strategies to improve child safety. Our first presenter will be Barbara Manazzo from the Royal Children's Hospital Safety Centre in Melbourne. She will be followed by Amber Fuller from the City of Palmerston in the Northern Territory, Australia. Then Julie Chambers from Starship Children's Health, Auckland, New Zealand, will then do her little presentation. And Stacey Wilcox from WaterSafe, Auckland, New Zealand, will, will come up at the end. Um, I now have great pleasure in handing over to Barbara Manazzo, who's going to um, present her perspectives on evidence-based strategies for child safety. So handing over to you now, Barbara. Thank you, Alan. Um, so basically I work for the Safety Centre at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne and the Safety Centre was started by the burn surgeon here at the hospital, uh, Dr Murray Clark, um, who had a vision of reducing the number of injuries and the severity of injuries uh, to children. So it's uh, been well over 30 years that the Safety Centre has been here working on uh, safety promotion and injury prevention. And we're also Australia's first internationally designated affiliate safe community support centre of the World Health Organisation, collaborating centre on community safety promotion based at the Karolinska Institute, Sweden. Basically, if we look back at, um, at, at safety, um, as is being described by Leif Svonström, um, safety is the fundamental need and a right because health and safety um, uh, are a fundamental right of human beings. Safety is a prerequisite for the maintenance and improvement of the health and, and welfare of any population. It is a basic need of human beings and that was uh, put forward by Svonström back in 1998. Um, when we're working on um, uh, safety initiatives in the safety centre. Um, in this case, basically, uh, I'm just um, showing you that we are currently working on some road safety, some burns prevention, some choking and suffocation prevention, some falls prevention, some dog bite, um, amongst other things. So usually we look at the size of the problem and the current situation with each of those and the short term outcomes, the 12 to 18 months, uh, the projected longer term outcomes, the two to three years, the proven and promising interventions, so the good buys um, and also we look closely at that to make sure that we're minimising uh, the unnecessary duplication um, and develop capacity for data and resource analysis within the local networks. Um, and really working towards forging stronger alliances with the corporate sector, which also create uh, important opportunities. Um, the successes that we've had in uh, Australia, or in Victoria at least, um, uh, that I know of have been related to engineering or design changes to hazards or hazardous products uniformly applied through the use of legislation or enforcement including child restraint containers for medications or poisonous substances, modifications for children's sleepwear, swimming pool fencing, bars on windows in high-rise apartments, reduction of maximum hot water temperatures in the home and the ongoing enhancement and improvement of these existing approaches is a further key child injury prevention strategy. I mean there's been lots of um, work, further work done since the 70s for example in the children's sleepwear um, and there's been lots of work done in the swimming pool fencing to move it forward. Yes, so we were uh, the, the point of speaking about the successes in child injury prevention in Australia. 
So, and they were related to the engineering or design changes to hazards or hazardous products uniformly applied through the use of legislation or enforcement, including the child restraints containers for medications or poisonous substances, the modification to children's sleepwear, and the swimming pool fencing, the bars on the windows in high-rise apartments, the reduction of maximum hot water temperature in the home. And the ongoing enhancement and improvement of these existing approaches is a further key to child injury prevention strategy. Um, one of the presenters earlier spoke about the, uh, or referred to the child safe, uh, the European um, manual that was developed on evidence-based. In Australia we also had uh, something similar um, and when we worked through that basically um, uh, it was uh, similar outcomes in that publication. It's called Child Safety uh, Evidence-Based um, and the hospital was involved with Melbourne University as well as uh, the Department of Health on that. Um, and uh, what came out of that was uh, the importance of more collaboration, coordination, uh, committed approach to child safety uh, from the funders of injury prevention, from the service providers, from the manufacturers and also from the retailers of child uh, nursery furniture and equipment and products to ensure that information and products are continually updated and programs are sustained. Um, and also to ensure that the information and products are con um, constantly updated and, and program uh, are sustained. It was uh, through the maternal child health nurse focus groups that um, these suggestions were offered um, and we need to be constantly actively seeking to ensure that injury prevention and safety promotion is uh, uh, back on the agenda and a priority agenda item. Um, and to try and actively seek to change the knowledge and attitudes of the public and decision makers to make it possible to implement effective measures fully and properly. Um, to look at effective injury prevention strategies as well as cost effective strategies uh, to be identified and piloted with sufficient resources and it will be necessary to undertake high quality evaluation of these strategies. This will ensure that they are uh, widely disseminated to the field if they are found to be effective or if they prove to be ineffective that they might be withdrawn. Um, and to advance the evidence-based practice uh, we really need to do that through leadership and continually developing and nurturing the partnerships and linkages uh, because there, there will be opportunities to share, to share the successful strategies. Um, and the injury prevention priorities need to be planned rather than introduced as a response to an incident. And uh, as some of the previous speakers have said, it's really about having a, a mix of strategies effective in reducing specific injuries. So the community-wide approaches or large-scale campaigns which encompass educational, environmental, legislative strategies, improved treatment or medical uh, response. Uh, for example, in Australia, scolds and injury and, and child injury generally as in the safe communities approach. Um, so burns and scolds has been a perfect example. And um, targeting the um, uh, carefully targeting the, pro uh, uh, the targeting of the program. So targeting those at greatest risk and attending to public areas. So because the capacity to enforce or monitor the safety compliance have been found to be effective. Um, with education, for example, media-based individual or group with or without print material on its own has not been found to have an impact on injury outcomes. Education is more likely to be associated with a reduction in injury if it's coupled with enhancing access to safety devices such as discounts or giveaways, particularly for low socioeconomic groups, coupled with regulation or enforcement perhaps if it's delivered over several occasions or is extended counselling 30 minutes or more. And if we look back at um, our information on uh, the safe communities uh, concept of working collaboratively and sharing the information and how everybody um, it really requires a multi-sectorial approach, 
like in local government where the mayor and, and the CEO together they uh, lead the work um, and it's a shared responsibility um, by governments and also at di different societal levels um, and the organisations and the populations. Um, so we need a systematic approach to have success in safety promotion and dissemination um, and this approach would be improved by um, ongoing and closer working relationships between the researchers and leadership in research and evaluation, practitioners and community involvement. Um, some of the challenges and also opportunities have been around the quality of the data. Um, so Victoria and Australia has a number of key strengths in health and safety promotion and injury prevention research including some well established and multidisciplinary research centres based in academic and NGO settings. A number of valuable databases that can be used for research but we need to continue to work towards the continual improvement towards access to quality data and to improve quality of data and keeping this in mind as well as using common sense and listening to the community and the wide range of knowledge out there. This gives us a great opportunity to bring about safety promotion work useful for safe communities. Um, we need further support for local level practitioners, uh, local level practitioners and policy makers in terms of evaluation, high quality evaluation. Evaluation is sometimes poorly developed in community-based health safety promotion interventions. Resource limitations have restricted the availability of more detailed data through emergency department surveillance systems. And in addition to the capacity to conduct follow-up studies to identify and develop intervention strategies, we need to determine the cost effectiveness of our work. We also need to ensure adequate research into the effectiveness and efficiency of child injury prevention strategies as a key component of this system. So really translating the research um, and having the consistency of messages as was said earlier and adequately resourcing and monitoring and evaluating the programs um, and also providing enough resources to build and enhance workforce capacity. Now um, falls in children for example, so um, that's actually one of the topics that um, we've always had as um, an ongoing um, issue for us uh, to work on um, and of course we look at the um, uh, indirect cost as, a lo as lost productive capacity, direct cost to the Australian healthcare system, cost to the other sectors and then the estimated total lifetime cost of cases that occur or falls. And if we look at the, um, if we refer back to the evidence-based model of prevention uh, image or design that uh, was put together by the Harbourview Injury Prevention Research Centre, um, uh, basically um, it, it, it has that holistic, the parent education, the regulation, the legislation, uh, the working with um, the different um, uh, stakeholders um, for the evidence base, so that systematic approach to injury prevention. Was there any questions or any comments at all? Yes, uh, Barbara, we have two questions. One comes from uh, one of our participants and says, are you aware of any funding support that is available for in-depth evaluation, which is often a major cost of a strategy, possibly already often being run on a very tight funding budget? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of, um, of, of any um, current um, funding availability uh, to do that. No, I'm not aware of any. Okay. And the second question was, um, do, you have, do you have any views or thoughts about the role of social media in, uh, in the prevention of childhood injuries? Uh, yes. Now, just if if we just go back a second to the funding question, just for a, a second, to say that um, it, it should really be that um, the funding for the evaluation should really be as part of each of the programs that we work on, as part. You know, when the when the thought process is put together, when the plan is put together to work on a particular project, 
you should be part of that. Uh, but also, um, of course, uh, we could have more than that if if we needed to find out more than just our immediate uh, small project that we're working on. Um, so it shouldn't be just a, 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 a minor part of the program, but as a as a part of the development of that program, um, when it's thought of working on a, a particular project, and as far as social media, um, uh, very much so. I think that um, for us here at the hospital, we've really noticed that in the recent, um, even in the recent six to nine months, um, the amount of um, access to um, our information is um, continually evolving and changing. So there's so much more access by phones and there's so much more access by um, the social media uh, and the importance and the role that that has for us to be promoting the information. Um, and so the way of working um, has kind of evolved over time as well. So rather than actually um, uh, having so much more printed material, really focusing on that web-based um, social media and all the other opportunities that we have to access families and youth to uh, deliver the safety information. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for that. I'm going to bring um, Stacey. Greetings to um, New Zealand and also Australia and Japan. My name is Amber Fuller, the Community Development Officer for the City of Palmerston. I am responsible for chairing the Palmerston Safe Kids Network, whose mission is preventing childhood injuries and improving the general well-being and safety of children. I also act as Secretary for the Palmerston Safe Communities Committee, which is responsible for monitoring our city's safe communities designation. And today I aim to demonstrate how the City of Palmerston has successfully used evidence-based data from hospital admissions to implement a very effective child safety campaign titled Look at Me, Look at Me. Overall, this webinar speech will take approximately 10 to 15 minutes with questions and answers included at the end. Let me begin by providing you with a basic background on the Palmerston Safe Communities Program. The City of Palmerston's community development team covers youth, seniors, children, families, safe communities and a healthy communities program. The City has approximately 32,000 residents, 15 suburbs, 9 schools, 1 Indigenous village and 2 main shopping centres. In March 2008, Palmerston became the first community to be named an international safe community in the Northern Territory. The Safe Communities Program is overseen by the Palmerston Safe Communities Committee and has one working group. This working group is known as Palmerston Safe Kids Network, which produces an annual action plan identifying programs, initiatives and injury prevention strategies. And a major obstacle that we've encountered when developing our injury prevention strategies is how do we source tangible figures which identifies injury trends giving us a basis of where we should focus our attention. We were able to answer this question by analysing admissions data from the Royal Darwin Hospital specific to Palmerston over a 31 month period. The analysis related to injury in the 0 to 14 year age group from January 2005 to August 2007. And although this does sound like a long time ago, the data has been useful to the establishment of a long-term sustainable child safety campaign. The analysis represents the Palmerston Safe Kids Network efforts to facilitate and su support sustainable injury prevention awareness campaigns and safety initiatives. Report findings show on average that there were 8.5 hospital admissions per month during the 31 month period specific to Palmerston. The majority of the 263 hospital admissions were from the suburbs of Maldon, Grey and Woodjoff, which are low socioeconomic suburbs. Of the injuries which listed as a specific place of occurrence, the majority took place in the home, being 45 in total, 
with 35 happening at school and 23 in relation to road accidents. The major causes of injury were falls, head injuries, burns and poisoning. Following the analysis was the compilation of a series of child safety posters and brochures. The brochures highlight that injuries don't need to be part of a kid's life. Palmerston kids are admitted to hospital each year because of falls, head injuries, poisoning, burns and scalds among the most common. This research provided the Safe Communities program with evidence-based data to build child safety and injury prevention strategies for the 2009-2011 periods. Developed was a campaign titled Look at Me, Look at Me to promote the importance of parental supervision in preventing unintentional childhood injuries in the Palmerston community. To promote the campaign, three main steps were taken. Step one was a visual promotion of posters and visual displays that were developed and the messages in these posters include I can climb really high, always keep a close eye on kids and playgrounds, I can run really fast, always hold a child's hand near traffic, I can reach up high, hot water burns like fire, I can disappear in a blink of an eye, never take your eyes off kids around water and always be within arm's reach. I want to grow up just like you, always buckle your kids up in the back seat in an appropriate child restraint. I can ride a, a bike, helmets, protective gear and safety lessons are important because falls can and do happen and I like coloured things too. Dangerous things are swallowed every day by children, usually when they are at home. Step two was the development of an annual child safety expo. The expo aims to increase the community's knowledge of the causes of unintentional childhood injuries the ways they can be prevented and the best ways to manage them should an injury occur. These messages continue to be promoted through the local library. And step three was a development of a safety display in schools and centres. Both the schools and neighbourhood centres were approached to display the posters. Falls from trees, playground equipment and furniture are the most common cause. Most of these happen in or around the home. Falls are often viewed as part of growing up, but they can cause serious injury and in some cases they require long-term medical treatment. Poisoning is another common injury caused from products commonly found around the home like medications, household chemicals and rat poisons. And every year too many Palmerston kids end up in hospital because of burns and scalds. Most burns and scalds happen in the kitchen or eating area. The child safety brochures reinforce that parents use placemats instead of tablecloths to keep mugs and cups away from the edge and to keep kids away from anything hot, including barbecues and fires. Currently, the accompanying posters for the campaign are displayed at the local Palmerston Library and special safety events like the Palmerston Safety Expo, which is held annually. There are plans for the future to revamp the posters with new pictures and safety messages after the 10-year hospitalisations report is released by the Department of Health. As you can see, the promotion of child safety through evidence-based strategies is effective and provides a designated safe community with sound direction into the future. Thank you for listening and I hope that you found this presentation helpful. Feel free to ask any questions in relation to the campaign success or the Palmerston Safe Communities Program, which I will answer to the best of my knowledge. Thank you, Amber. Um, a fabulous uh, pre presentation. We have one question from Melbourne, Victoria, and the person asked, could you tell us a little bit, bit, a little bit more about what the Child Safety Expo entailed, please? Uh, yes, okay, so our last Child Safety Expo, um, we actually held this at our local Bunnings store, uh, which is a hot spot for children and families. Uh, we had a child safety trail in the, um, the, the local Bunnings store and they were to go to the different organisations that represent an aspect of safety like Red Cross, 
um, we had the water safety branch there, um, kids safe NT. We also had a child restraint uh, check-in service from kids safe NT outside of Bunnings where they checked uh, child car seats to make sure that they were up to date and, and that they complied with legislation because we do have new legislation here in the Northern Territory that says that we must have um, in properly installed and fitted child restraints uh, capsules. Um, also, as the children went around, they had a map that they took with them. The map was stamped if they answered a safety question. And then at the end, they took the, the safety map to, which was me and some other community development staff. We had a stall there. They took that to us and put that in a box and we drew a prize at the end. Um, any other questions about that, about that safety stall that we held? Uh, no, Amber, but, uh, but I'm quite sure if people are interested, they could certainly contact you, and I appreciate you putting your contact details on your slide. Um, Definitely. There, okay. There are no further questions to Stacey. With um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, um, in New Zealand, Australia, and Japan. Uh, I'm Julie Chambers, and I'm the Trauma Coordinator at Starship Children's Hospital in Auckland. I've been working in child injury prevention policy and research over the past nine years, and this presentation is uh, about key issues in child injury prevention. I'll cover major causes of child injury, um, at the, uh, talk briefly about sources of data and information, and outline major issues involved for those providing child injury prevention programs. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge Carolyn Coggan and Tanya Peters for their generous sharing of slide material. So this slide now shows a um, an overview of the major types of child injury. Serious and fatal events happen when children and cars mix badly. That's when children are passengers, pedestrians and riders and drivers of vehicles. Burns, poisoning and drowning all follow closely. And I think this data is consistent internationally from what I've observed. I'm using New Zealand information here, but it is consistent internationally. The largest number of incidents overall happen due to falls. However, if we think about falls, it's not just a single group of um, events. It's possible to have the same consequence from a fall when falling off a mountain or falling off a bunk. Um, so the injury prevention interventions are very different for each of these. And I think you'll find you start to work down into programs to prevent falls, it's important to differentiate the, um, the cause of the injury from the falls. Some injuries are unavoidable. In other words, practitioners cannot reasonably advocate for stopping or would not want to stop the activity that led to the injury. For example, we don't want to stop children playing sports or being active. And that's important. We have to work with what's possible, what's achievable. And also, from the data. Now, the major issues for preventing um, child injury, pre preventing child injury, um, are about practitioners, how practitioners get the message across. And it's really important, communicating is really important. Child injury can often be invisible in our communities. Um, decision makers can believe that accidents cannot be prevented and Many people believe that measures to protect children from unintended harm are really about bubble wrapping children. So the graph, the pie chart on the left of your screen shows how in New Zealand, child injury actually accounts for about a third of unintentional death, of death, child death by cause of death. From 2006 to 2010, uh, just over a third of child mortality was due to unintentional injury. On the right, there's a bar graph that shows success. I think it's really important to show the size of the problem and also evidence of success. This bar graph shows child injuries reducing over time. These reductions are not accidental. They are the result of consistent and continuous application of effort by many organisations and agencies um, and large numbers of dedicated and focused individuals. I also like to have common sense examples to tell people when they talk about bubble wrapping, like the introduction of home swimming pool fences and how that saved so many lives. Educating decision makers 
and the community in this way is the basis of child injury prevention and safety promotion. Now let's look more closely at the data. Data's, um, child, hospital services are probably the most important source of data. And in some respects it's quite scary because it's the bottom line. It's what we're really aiming for and it's useful to keep that in mind. We're aiming for a reduction in the number of children that come through the door. Having said that, other data is also important, such as how many media stories include, include prevention messages, how many government reports and budgets include child prevention, injury prevention projects. Better understanding of data can expose issues that have been obscured, such as better death investigations, identifying more deaths from infant deaths from suffocation than we realised, and emerging issues such as changes in the incidence of poisoning from inhaled substances. In the next slides, I'll touch on the importance of best practice and collaboration. Um, in my work, I, in my role, I constantly review best practice articles and reports. The most useful one is the Child Safety Good Practice Guide. This is an excellent one, and it runs over the um, what makes a good practice in child injury prevention. Projects, it's best to use projects that have been evaluated as effective, supported by expert opinion, successfully work in the real world, and can demonstrate a clear link between the strategy and reduced incidents. For example, secure storage of poisonings. When we've looked at the data and effectively communicated it to our funders, have the resources and chosen an effective strategy, we move to implementation. But just before then, it's useful to look at collaboration, because collaboration is best practice. Interagency, multi-sector coordination, group sharing expertise, information and experiences, and partnerships. How we work together, how we share information. They're all really important. And now we can move to action. All models are wrong, some are useful. This is a safe communities model and it's really a useful roadmap for putting programs in place. So the first step is you identify the program and remember evaluation early on in the, state, in the process. Then we define our audience, our, we identify resources and we set goals and objectives. We choose best practice strategies and we begin to test and refine. The next step is to implement and to uh, make sure that we integrate the evaluation that we've, we've carried out. For example, we might run a car seat program, we get some funding, we find the best practice strategy, which is education and distribution, we choose the strategy, um, we might run a small clinic and if we have good part when we have good partnerships we can contact people who have done this type of work before and build their experience into our formative evaluation. Then we run our clinics, we evaluate, and then we tell people, disseminate about how we've been how what we've done and what it's what and what our successes were. And by running these programs we all lead this all leads us to the development of a safety culture. So what we have and what I've summarised is that we have the basis of data for our information. It's important to communicate the message. It's important to use the data. Then to choose our um, best practice interventions, choose our strategies, to measure, make sure that we know that we're effective, and then to feed back to everyone. Because this is about building a safety culture, and building a safety culture is a holistic approach to community well-being. And it takes a broad view of prevention and promotes multiple partnerships in order to meet our goals. I've used child restraints as just one example and there are many others where having a safety culture makes the delivery of child injury prevention much more efficient and achievable. And this is definitely a rich area for future research. A safety culture is where we can all take part in achieving the results we all want, fewer injuries and fewer deaths from injuries. So in summary, I've briefly identified the major injury issues for children in their homes, when they're out and about at play and on the road. I've discussed the need to inform decision makers and funders about child injury in meaningful ways. I've 
talked about accessing the best sources of data and the wider sources of data and how important it is to apply it. It's important to choose interventions that are proven to reduce injury and to put in place meaningful evaluations. And most important, the value of working together. Now here are some resources where there's, there's lots of information out there and I'd encourage you to have a look, those of you that are just new to the field, very rich sources of information from all these different um, places. So in conclusion, it's now time to unleash the promise of governments and create a world where children can learn, play, grow up and live without being killed or injured. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. A very, very comprehensive report. Um, we have one question from Western Australia, and, and the person asks, how easy it is uh, for New Zealand communities to access that accident and injury data? Are there any we issues have, around that for, for communities to access that information? The, um, there are several sources of information. We are very fortunate to have the Injury Prevention Research Unit at Otago University, who are funded by our Ministry of Health. Um, I could make that link available so people can see that website. It's a very useful website. Um, Alan, perhaps later I'll put it on the screen when my project goes up. So that's the Injury Prevention Research Unit at Otago University. I'd encourage people to Google that. Just recently, Auckland Council, the local council here, have um, put up an injury prevention data page so people can see the types of injuries that happen in local communities. And of course, there's always local co co connection with your um, local hospital and, and accident and emergency and making contact with your district health board. Um, that would be on a case-by-case -case basis. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Fabulous. Okay, there are no further questions, but if you do have any other questions that you'd like to send in, I'm more than happy to forward those on to Julie or to any of the other presenters, and we'll try and get back to you as best we possibly can. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Stacey Wilcox. Stacey is from WaterSafe, Auckland, New Zealand, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about the type of strategies that they use at WaterSafe, New Zealand. Um, to do with child safety. So over to you, Stacey. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, and thank you to the presenters that have already presented. Kia ora, good afternoon, and good morning to all of those listening. Um, my name's Stacey. I'm the Drowning Prevention Coordinator at WaterSafe Auckland. Um, and we are a regional water safety organisation here in New Zealand. What I'll be talking to you about today is um, and a, a campaign that we've uh, collaborated on uh, and it's around reducing home swimming pool drownings in under five year olds. So just to give a bit of background, uh, our vision is a water safe Auckland free from drowning and the mission is to prevent drowning through leadership, advocacy and delivery of water safety education. So as well as this project we do a number of others um, and that all are uh, collaborative projects as well. So we'll just talk about one project today, but there are contact details at the end of this presentation for anything else that you may want to access. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Auckland, um, we're quite unique in the fact we've got a very diverse community, uh, both in terms of ethnic diversity and age, uh, and we have approximately 30% of the New Zealand population in Auckland. Auckland has two coastlines, three harbours and two major estuaries, uh, so which poses a very high risk for child drowning, which leads us on to today's presentation. So drowning rates in Auckland, from 1995 to 2002, Auckland had the highest number of drownings per region. Over the last 10 years, we've worked in collaboration with our aquatic partners together with injury prevention, health, safety and the formal education sector to address these statistics. Over the last five years, we've had an average of 20 drownings per year, about one-fifth of the national drowning toll, and we're about a third of the population as mentioned before. Our drowning rate has reduced over the past five years to 1.3 per 100,000, 
which is half the national average, and we are currently seeing a downwarding trend, uh, which is really pleasing, but we can't afford to be complacent. So this is the current picture of drowning deaths in our region, and we want to continue um, that reduction. There is a gap um, in non-fatal data and hospitalizations, um, and we need to improve sort of uh, getting that sort of data. Um, but at this stage, we are working with a number of uh, fatal drownings, and that's what I'll be referring to today. So the New Zealand fertility rate for zero to four-year-olds, um, you'll notice on the slide it says preschool. Wherever I say preschool, we're referring to um, under the age of five years old. So all of our presenters today have mentioned about drowning and fencing of swimming pools. In New Zealand, the Fencing of Swimming Pools Act was introduced in 1987, and that's very much contributed to the downward trend. And more recently, targeted campaigns to keep under five safer around water, um, particularly in the home, uh, and not just around swimming pools. So the particular message reminding pool owners of their responsibility, and we've got a certain campaign around that, which I'll uh, highlight very soon. So just giving you a bit more of an idea of uh, drownings for our under, under four-year-olds, or sorry, under five-year-olds, 31% um, home pools, 31% in the domestic, uh, so baths and buckets and things like that, 19% inland still water, and 6% rivers, streams or creeks. 8% of drowning victims uh, were children aged zero to four years between uh, 2007 to 2011, and 13% total drowning victims uh, were zero to four in Auckland. So this is higher than the national rate. So I mentioned in the previous slide that drownings have been steadily decreased, but decreasing, but this is still considered far too high, especially for our young children. So the process of drowning, as some of you may know, uh, particularly for children, Silent sink is what we, we call it. A drowning child can go unnoticed, no sound, no struggling, and no splashing. So unlike other injuries children may suffer, it is said that a drowning child can go unnoticed until it's too late. So I mentioned earlier the Fencing of Swimming Pools Act um, has contributed to the decrease in home pool drownings. Um, and the Fencing of Swimming Pools Act states that any body of water deeper than 400 millimetres requires fencing in accordance with the Act, including swimming pools, spa pools, portable or inflatable pools. And you can see the rest of the other points in the Act that I've um, pulled out. So there has been some arguments in New Zealand that this legislation is too lenient and allows for exemptions if there are other layers of protection such as an automatic pool cover, pool alarm, etc. In response to this ambiguity, industry representatives, child safety advocates, and government departments work collaboratively to produce New Zealand Standard 8500 in 2006, which clarifies and provides clear guidance of the requirements for fencing and safety barriers to restrict young children's access to swimming pools. There has been some comparison with the Australian Standard uh, 2007, which essentially requires isolation fencing, for example, a four-sided fence. Accordingly, a four-sided barrier with child-resistant res door sets that permit access from a building to a pool is a less safe option than that should only be permitted when physical circumstances preclude a four-sided barrier without child-resistant door sets. The Paediatric Society of New Zealand agrees with this and has produced a position statement that endorses isolated fencing as the most effective method of preventing young children from drowning in home pools. Currently, our Act, the Fencing and Swimming Pools Act in New Zealand, is going through a revision process and public consultation has closed. Hopefully we're expecting an outcome later on this year. So compliance rates according to the Fencing and Swimming Pools Act. Um, this was external research done by the University of Otago in 2007 and concluded that fencing of home swimming pools 
has been shown to be the most effective method to reduce drowning deaths in young children and home swimming pools. At the time, so this was, as I said, done in 2007, home pool and spa compliance rates for the Auckland region were 15% above the national average. The Auckland region showed an 85.6% compliance rate compared to 70.5% for the whole of the country. So this research was done in, 2000, uh, sorry, in 1997 with local authorities and again replicated in 2007 for comparative purposes. The aim was to identify the current status of compliance with and enforcement of the Fencing and Swimming Pools Act. Unfortunately, current figures could not have been obtained for this presentation um, from our local Auckland Council, um, but it is thought to be similar rates um, and compliance rates in the Auckland region at the moment. Which leads us on to an effective strategy that uh, ourselves at WaterSafe Auckland um, paired with our local councils and um, our what we call ACC um, and a number of other funders have come on board since then as well. So this campaign was launched in 2004 and aims to reduce home pool drownings in the under five age group. The campaign promotes the message that pool owners need to keep young children safe by providing appro approved pool barriers that comply with the regulations um, that I've already talked about. The campaign also reminds parents and caregivers to supervise children at all times in the pool and parental supervision was mentioned by both Barbara and Amber so it's obviously both a, an issue for uh, New Zealand and Australia as well as encouraging pool owners to have secondary layers of protection in place for their pool such as pool or door alarms or pool covers. So we've, as I said, we've had a number of funders since the uh, campaign started in 2004, but the campaign has continued with consistent messaging and home pool safety promotion for a variety of ways that I'll detail. So the methods of delivery is we've taken a multi-dimensional approach, buy-in from a range of stakeholders, greater engagement with pool owners, consistent safety messages, and more regular compliance inspections. Uh, by council officers. So all of this has contributed to increased public awareness of swimming pool safety and it's about working collaboratively as, as all of our um, presenters have talked about today. So the key messages of the campaign, children aged 12 months to 3 years most commonly drown in home swimming pools, always empty paddling pools after use and place and storage were not being used. All pools and spas must be fenced in New Zealand. Always shut the gate and replace the pool cover after use. And always actively supervise your children within sight and reach, which has been a common message in our presentations today. So these are some of the resources that have been developed with the Your Pool, Your Responsibility campaign. We've had this particular resource goes out to all pool owners. Um, and includes the Fencing and Swimming Pools Act, uh, all the uh, diagrams and those types of things, and they are given by pool inspectors to homeowners and also um, retailers as well. They are available through libraries, um, events, local newspapers, uh, promoting those messages. So other resources we've seen uh, or we've developed are uh, around uh, this pool needs fencing for your inflatable and your portable pools, uh, for spa pools, and we've had a DVD developed as well, and also a waterproof uh, CPR chart that can be put up in the outdoor pool area. So, conclusion. Collaboration is the key, and I think that's actually been one of our main messages today with all of the presenters. It's about involving a wide range of stakeholders, who've got a common vision, consider a multi-dimensional approach, consistent messaging to effectively promote the messages in a variety of ways. Where to from here? So this project, as I said, uh, started in 2004, so almost 10 years. Um, so we're looking at different events that we can be involved in, such as the home show, uh, re-establish regular pool safety forums that involve not only uh, pool safety advocates, but we're looking at involving retailers, manufacturers, uh, the industry, as well as safety people, 
um, and education, so early childhood as well. Um, and as I said earlier, changes, possible changes in legislation, and it's about maintaining that child safety objective. So thank you very much. Um, if you do have any questions after the presentation, uh, please feel free to contact me on those details. All of our resources are available for download um, or free to order from our website. Um, and please stay in touch. So thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you, Stacey. A wonderful, wonderful presentation as well. Um, I have one question from Melbourne, Victoria, and the person just said if you had the power to change three things that, or three challenging things facing pool safety today, what would they actually be? What would you, what would you like to see changed? Uh, probably more buy-in from retailers. Um, we found it quite challenging. Some we do have selected um, retailers that are very proactive. Uh, however, some of the bigger ones um, are, have been harder to get on board. The other challenge we're facing is around the portable spas and the kit set pools that can be sold at Bunnings or um, quite readily available at Kmart and things like that, that are up and down for the summer. Technically, um, according to the Fencing and Swimming Pools Act, they should be fenced. Um, however, these are proving quite hard to monitor at this stage. So there definitely needs to be more work around that. Um, and that's definitely one thing we could, if we could change. Um, Immediately, we, we could, and obviously, spa pools uh, coming into the country and being sold are always um, going to be an issue as well in terms of the regulations and retailers um, thinking that they don't need or promoting that they don't need fencing when in fact they do. So, there are some mixed messages that, so that we could, if we could change immediately, that we would. Okay, thank you, Stacey. Terrific. Um, okay, um, back online, and also Julie and Amber, um, if you'd like to turn your webcams back on again, folks. Um, we have a question which I think is actually um, directed at Stacey. Uh, this one says, our family friends have a very busy two-year-old child who pushed an outdoor chair up to the edge of a, an isolated swimming pool fence and managed to climb over mm -hmm. and drown. Um, the question is, do you promote awareness of ways in which children can get over these fences? That's a very good question. Um, and although it's probably very um, easy to say actively supervised all the time, um, you know, that's that's probably goes for all injury prevention really. But at the end of the day, we know that young children are very busy and they can move around incredibly fast. Um, I guess the one message is that just make sure nothing is around the pool or around the fence that can be moved. So we say, you know, if there's any pot plants or steps or boxes that, or chairs in this case, that can be moved around, make sure that they are completely clear of the area um, and so that a, a small child can't move, something like that. Right. Do you... Although, again, it's very easy to say these things um, in, in theory um, and in realistic realistically it may be difficult to implement something so that is uh, that is noted definitely okay and there's probably another question here that's been directed at you again um, do you have any safety distances between open waterways and playgrounds do you have any sort of recommendations about that um, that's a really good question um, and that's something that we get asked very frequently um, Unfortunately, I guess you can't go off and fence everything, uh, ponds and rivers and, and the ocean and things like that. So again, it comes down to active supervision. Um, some councils have chosen to fence off play areas if they're close to a waterway. Um, not all, unfortunately, but that is something that we could recommend as a regional organisation. Um, that, yeah, that's a very, very hard one. At the end of the day, it does come down to also education as well. So we've got a number of education strategies where we speak to um, parents and uh, teachers. Um, we involve early childhood uh, educators, primary schools, community groups, and it's just around getting those messages out there and really reinforcing that supervision and be within sight and reach for young children. Um, as I said, unfortunately, we can't go off and fence everything. And in, in an ideal world, we would like to 
um, you know, make sure the play area is, is separate and doesn't have that access, but we, we try and do everything else that we can as well. Okay. It's obviously that pool safety is sort of quite a, a topical conversation at the moment. We have one final question for you, Stacey. Um, uh, the question reads, has evaluation been conducted on the reach of your pool, your responsibility campaign, and does it indicate behaviour change has occurred? It's a very good question, and I guess that leads on from Barbara's presentation around evaluation. Um, it is evaluated to an extent um, in terms of the compliance of um, pool fencing and uh, abiding by that, I suppose you could say. We, we do work very uh, closely with Auckland Council who monitor all that and they do their, um, their inspections and things like that. So we get data from, from Council in terms of um, homeowners um, who have changed their behaviour um, in terms of pool fencing and supervision. It is one of those things where we can't always provide numbers in terms of reach. Uh, our messages go out to the wider Auckland community and not just uh, specifically homeowners. So we haven't evaluated um, to that extent, but we can definitely get numbers in terms of the pool owners who have um, had behaviour change in terms of um, re uh, being compliant with, with the Act. Um, inspections are done every three years here in Auckland uh, for pools, so that data is kept on a three-yearly uh, basis. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that concludes all of our questions, and uh, I'd like to thank each of you for your wonderful presentations today. Um, I'm quite sure there may be a lot of additional questions that people would like to ask and the opportunity to do that, you can contact each of our presenters via their email addresses or you can send an email to myself or to Tanya Peters at Safe Communities Foundation New Zealand and we'll be more than happy to pass on your responses. So on behalf of all the participants, thank you to Stacey, Julie, Amber and Barbara for your wonderful presentations and for giving up your time so freely today. Um, and we look forward to further reports from you in, in, the time, in the time ahead. Just a quick reminder that uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on Friday um, and we'll send you an email link if you registered for it and it will also be on the Australian Safe Communities website and also on Safe Communities Foundation New Zealand's website um, from Friday as well. Also, you will shortly receive an email with a sh very brief evaluation that we'd like you to fill out if you wouldn't mind. Your feedback is really important to improving these webinars and also to find out are there any other topics that you would like us to present um, across both Australia and New Zealand. Um, and finally, could I just alert you to, we have our final webinar for the year, which is titled Alcohol Related Harm in the Community. And that will be held on Wednesday, the 16th of October. And for more details and registration, please see either of those two websites that I mentioned earlier. So on behalf of everyone, thank you to our presenters and thank you to our participants for joining us today. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.